quite a while. And then they just dropped the letter. Everybody hear me. We want to welcome you tonight. Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Uh, to uh, one of our FJMC Imagine Life well, uh, Mental Health Wellness Initiative webinars. We're delighted to be kicking part of this off with a fantastic presentation by Robert Gray tonight. I just want to mention what we're going to ask you to do, please, is to use the chat box if you have any questions, and we'll get to those. Uh, Robert will do his presentation, and then after the presentation, we hope to have a discussion. Uh, Robert Gray was born in Detroit. He grew up in the predominantly Jewish suburb of Oak Park, Michigan. He's the son of Hungarian parents who survived the Holocaust. And after a long career with companies such as AT&T, Cox Communications, and Turner Broadcasting, Robert found his way into the nonprofit world where he worked as a certified peer specialist in a wellness center, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, or NAMI. Now retired, Robert facilitates support groups for NAMI and enjoys his empty nest li life and wife with his wife, Lauren, and their dog, Blue. Robert is a member of Congregation Eitzheim in Marietta, Georgia, where he's working on what he calls his rejuvenation. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Robert. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Paul. So as Paul said, I'm Robert Gray, and I've been a member of Congregation Eitzheim in Marietta for almost 30 years now. I'm currently the co-vice president of religion, which means that I have the honor of being part of the team that has to figure out how we're going to do Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur services during the pandemic. And believe me, we're having meeting upon meeting to try and figure that out. So if any of you have any great ideas, <laughs> we'd love to hear from you. Let me first uh, thank the Etzheim Men's Club. I see a lot of you guys are here tonight and also the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs for having what I wanna say, the courage and the chutzpah to take on this health initiative, the mental health initiative. This is extremely important work and I applaud all of you for your efforts. So tonight what I'm gonna cover is my story, but I'm gonna talk about it sort of in reverse. Instead of talking about it from my childhood forward, I'm gonna actually talk about it from my adult life backwards. And uh, so I'm gonna start talking about things that occurred to me during my life as an adult, if I actually am an adult, I'm not really sure of that sometimes. Then I'm gonna talk about my childhood and I'm gonna use the, the story from the Passover Seder about the four children. And I have come up with another child, the fifth child, and you'll hear that um, when I get to that point in my story. As you know, I have written a book, which you can see on the bottom of your screen. And I wanna talk about not so much what's in the book, because I will be covering some of that in my story, but I really want you to understand why I wrote this book and how much it took of me to actually put this story on paper and get it published, because it was quite an endeavor, sometimes painful. And then I'd like to share with you a short two to three minute video called Lift the Mask. Uh, I actually just discovered this the other night and I thought it was very meaningful. So I'm going to share that with you. There's actually an entire series that talks about Lift the Mask. This is just the trailer of the film that I'm gonna be showing you. And then if you have any questions along the way, if you wanna please put them in the chat box and we'll try to cover them. I'm not gonna speak for probably more than 15 or 20 minutes. So we'll have some time to cover questions in the chat box. And feel free to ask anything because I don't really have any secrets. I've kind of learned over the last several years that it, it's not healthy to have secrets. So if there's something that you really wanna know about me or my story or how it impacted me or my family or my community, please feel free to ask. So before I start talking about my specific mental health journey, I wanna talk a little bit about masks. Now, many of us have been wearing masks quite often lately to protect ourselves and others from the coronavirus. But I personally have been wearing a mask for most of my life. And only recently have I been able to really live without it. So I want you to take a look at my mask. So here's me in my mask. You can see I'm a rather well-dressed businessman type wearing this mask, hiding my pain and my tears and my sorrow. So why did I wear this mask? Well, the reason was because I was feeling so many emotions that were tearing me apart, but I couldn't let anybody know. I had to be a good husband and father. I had to be a valued employee and I had to be a man. Men aren't supposed to be weak or vulnerable. 
Men get hurt and walk it off. We're taught, taught as boys, get up and walk it off, dust yourself off, you'll be fine, get back in the game. Men are supposed to be strong. We're supposed to be the ones who ride in like knights in shining armor and on the brilliant white horse and make everything good and everything right. So if I couldn't just gut out my problems, I would have to face stigma. So stigma is a word that we use an awful lot and I'd like to talk about what that means by just giving you a few examples of what stigma might mean. So one of the stigmas is that depression equals weakness. And I'm gonna focus on depression because that's my diagnosis, but it certainly doesn't limit itself to depression only. So what's wrong with depression equals weakness? Well, I can't begin to tell you that how often I've heard this, but depression has nothing to do with personal weakness. It's actually a serious health condition that millions of men contend with every year. It's really not any different than if you develop diabetes or, a high, or high blood pressure, it can happen to anyone. And the thing that really makes me angry is when people talk about mental health versus physical health. Now, I've never understood why the brain is not considered a part of my physical body. If the brain has a problem, why is it separated from every other problem? Like what's the difference between a broken leg and a brain that's got a problem? I mean, to me, it just doesn't make sense, but that's how society tends to categorize things, as do insurance companies. Another form of stigma, a man should be able to control his feelings. So depression is a mood disorder. That means that it can make us feel down when there's really nothing to feel down about. We can't always control what we feel, but we can do our best to control how we react to our feelings. And sometimes, in, including choosing whether to ignore our problems or face them before they get out of hand is one of our biggest decisions. But how many times have you heard people say, oh, just cheer up or go for a walk? You know, you'll feel better if, if you smile. You'll feel better if, you know, you, you know, put on a new pair of, a pair of pants and look really nice. Well, there's a lot more to it than that. So we can't just turn it off and turn it off and on like some people think we can. Real men don't ask for help. Like I said before, we have this mask that we hide behind. Sometimes we do need to ask for help, but men don't like to ask for help. I can tell you that I thought that I could get over my illness without asking for anybody's help. I could just sort of wait, find a way to will myself through this and become healthy again, but that just wasn't true. Um, I was actually, interestingly enough, we, I just saw an ad on TV for some medication for depression. I can't recall which one it was. They all kind of run together to me. But it was about a woman wearing a mask. And, and I said to my wife, why don't they show men wearing masks? We have, this, we have issues. We have things that we hide behind. But it's not that typical for us to think about men needing help or asking for help. We just don't think that way. So imagine trying to battle a mental health problem as being something like trying to push a boulder up a mountain all by yourself. You know, it's just not something you can do all by yourself. But again, men are kind of in that mindset that this is something I can handle. This is something I can do by myself. Then there's the stigma about whether or not you can sort of get help through talk therapy. And I know some of you, I think, Paul, I think you're a therapist who does a lot of talk therapy. But I'm sure you know that ignoring depression doesn't necessarily make it go away. And sometimes we need to, we think that we know all the answers, but we don't. And talking through situations can be a very, very good strategy for people who are dealing with depression or mental health. Sometimes things are not that big as we think they are, but it really takes a professional or a peer specialist like I was to really help people get through their issues. Last one I wanna talk about is being a burden to others. Um, this again is one of those things where being unhealthy and refusing to seek treatment can really put a lot of pressure and stress on your family and your friends. But asking for help does not make you a burden. It makes people feel good that they can help their loved ones. So again, it doesn't pay to try and gut your way through something or, or think you can get by all by yourself and just because you think you're a burden to others. These are just a few of the possible stigmas. There's many. I mean, you know, another stigma could be like the only people who have mental health problems are, are people who are homeless. You know, like why would a person who wears a suit and tie have a mental health problem? And so there's millions of things that are out there that we call stigma. But the stigma really goes two ways. It's really there's a stigma within society that people in society think a certain way about mental health and people who have a mental illness. 
But then those of us who have the issue have our own stigma. And some of these are that I pointed out, I can do it by myself. I'm not really sick. You know, these things are in, in my head. They're things I believe, but they're not necessarily true. And one of the things that stigma does is it stops us from reaching out for help because we're so afraid to admit that we're vulnerable. We're so afraid to admit that we need help. So stigma is really a double-edged sword and something that I know a lot of what we're doing in the, in the mental health initiative is trying to eliminate that stigma through education and making sure that people are aware of, of what mental health and mental illness really is all about. So with that as a background, I wanna tell you about my own story now. And as I said, I'm gonna start in reverse. Um, my mental health, my mental illness really dates back to childhood. And I'd like to begin my remarks by showing you what my adult life, my adult life looked like, and then come back to visit where the childhood comes in and how I think the two can kind of merge together to create who I am and what I went through. So back in 1978, I finished graduate school, got an MBA, which I have to say were two of the two most stressful years of my life. I had been a psychology student thinking that I was gonna be a research psychologist. I wanted to run rats and do all that fancy stuff with rats. And all of a sudden I thought, I'm not gonna make any money doing this and I'm gonna be in school for a long time. And I had a panic attack and actually drove home to talk to my mother about what I should do with my life. And Time Magazine said, MBA, that's the degree to get. So I decided to, fine. So I finished my degree in psych and went to get my MBA and hated every minute of it, but it got me a job. So I started my professional career in Detroit doing a marketing research job for what was then known as Michigan Bell. It was in my hometown and I was married already. I got married in graduate school and life was, life was good. I loved my job. And in the course of working for Michigan Bell, I, I really thought I was on my way to a successful career. In 1984, if some of you were around back then, the uh, courts decided, the federal uh, courts decided that the Bell system had to split up because we were a monopoly. So I was given the choice of staying in Detroit with the local company or moving to Chicago with a national company. So I decided to make the move to Chicago. It just seemed like the more appealing job. Um, the problem was the job I moved into really stunk. And after divestiture, things were so disorganized that we didn't really know what we were doing. So I'd say for several months, I really wasn't doing anything but sitting in a nice building in Chicago, reading documentation and leaving early to catch the early train back. Um, I did enjoy living on the North Shore and being a new father was kind of cool. And actually riding the suburban train back to Deerfield where I lived made me feel kind of like a real adult. And so even though we relocated, I was really happy. So uh, things were starting, you know, continuing to look good. And then in 1987, things started to break down. Um, first thing that happened was I lost my dad suddenly. Um, I just got a phone call one day after I'd seen him the week before saying that he's gone. And uh, so that was a real, a real terrible blow. And I, I really felt bad, especially not just because I lost him, but because I really didn't think we knew each other. So after my 34 years of life with him, I had to start life without him and never really thought that I had a lot of commonality with him. I, it, that was a really hard thing for me to take. The other thing that was hard to take was in all my nine years of working, I never managed anybody. I always had my own job, my own responsibility, my own projects. And now all of a sudden I moved to a job where I have 14 management employees and 30 union people. And I don't know a damn thing about managing people. <laughs> I just assumed that you use your common sense and your human nature and everything's fine. Well, that, that ain't true. Um, all the other managers were well aware of what to do, were very experienced and were friends with each other. So I was really in over my head and I started having panic attacks. Um, I really didn't know what was going on, but I, I, I started pacing around. I went to medical once thinking I had a heart attack. I was just a nervous wreck. And I felt like a real failure after my boss decided to split my group in half and hire another manager to bring in to take half of my workload. That really made me feel like a failure because this new manager was an ex Navy guy, a real tough manager type person. And he was gonna manage the pants off me and make me look even worse than I already was. So 1998 comes along and a friend of mine tells me, I think you need a lot of help. I think you're really sick. He was a good friend, a neighbor, 
and he suggested I go to a, a men's, um, what do you want to call it, like a men's adventure group type thing, a weekend with a bunch of men. And it helped temporarily, but it didn't really give me any permanent kind of relief from my issues. So 1989, all of a sudden, um, my wife and I were dealing with infertility problems and we managed to solve them. And we had triplets. So not only did everything in my job life change, but now I have three times the stress because now I have three little babies. And I can honestly tell you in one day, we changed their diapers 27 times. I remember counting each time we did it. So now you can start to see around the late eighties, things are starting to get a little crazy for me. And, and keep in mind, I've not been diagnosed with anything. I've not seen any doctor. I just know that I'm under a lot of stress and, and, and really having trouble dealing with things. A couple of years later, the office that I worked in in Chicago was set to close and all of our regional offices were going to go centralized into Atlanta and we were downsizing. So this was a case where some people were gonna survive the downsizing and some people were not. And I was one of the ones who was not going to survive the downsizing. So now I had to find a job. And, but all of a sudden a job opened in Atlanta that was something that I was really cut out for. And next thing I know, I'm moving to Atlanta. But I thought everything was gonna be really good except the job disappeared. And I was ended up, I, they gave me another job, again, managing people. But my biggest problem was I was not one of the chosen people if you will. I was not one of the ones scheduled to go to Atlanta. And all of a sudden, there I am with all of these people who were supposed to go to Atlanta, the ones who I call the survivors. And again, I was totally out of my element. I, I felt totally alone. I felt like I was completely inferior. I couldn't, I couldn't function with these people who were what I thought were the all-stars. So I started having crying spells. Um, Oftentimes I'd stay at my desk late at night and then cry. Uh, I also had issues every time I had to go on an out of town trip, I got sick. Either a stomach problem, a head problem, some sort of issue would happen to me and, and I was just kind of totally losing control. So I'm about to get to the good part. 1994, on one of my out of town trips, I stayed in California with one of my cousins and he asked me if I knew anything about America Online. And I said, I've heard of it. I don't know what it is exactly. So he showed it to me and he logged, he logged us in and we were fooling around with chat rooms and talking to people. And he thought it was really just a lot of fun. And I was just intrigued by it. And I found myself coming home, getting home before he did from work and logging into his ID to see what was going on in America Online. And even late at night when he and his wife were in bed asleep, I'd go into their den and get online and fool around on America Online. And everything just seemed kind of innocent. I actually thought I was um, counseling people. I would get in conversations with people and, and talk to them about you know, their family problems and like I was some sort of a psychologist or a therapist. But after a while, things got a little different and sometimes I'd start flirting and some of the women would start flirting back. And eventually I started getting into some behaviors um, such as cyber sex and cyber sex led to phone sex. And the, the thing about it for me though, was it wasn't just sort of this sexual thing. I was truly feeling like emotions, like I was falling in love with these people. And there were three in particular. If you read my book, you'll know all about these three in particular um, that I was really messed up over. And all of this behavior became very addictive. So I started focusing more on my life on the internet than my real life. I took many risks um, doing things at work that I shouldn't do, doing things in my bedroom with my wife asleep that I shouldn't do, um, using for the phone, um, and everything I did was kept secret. Like I, I couldn't let anybody know who I was. I couldn't let anybody in my community know what I was doing. It was just an addiction, just like alcohol or drugs. You know, this was my drug of choice. And what it did for me was it kind of gave me an escape from everyday life. You know, I had something to look forward to besides triplets and work. Now I had this other life 
to go look look forward to. Uh, and unfortunately, it led me down a very, very, very bad path. The ultimate bad path happened in 1997 when I arranged a meeting with a woman and I knew exactly what I was doing. This was not some fantasy. This was like, I want to go meet this woman because we'd had several, several interesting conversations <laughs> over a number of months. And I think I probably did this on purpose or I planned it because I knew I was going to be in Michigan and I knew she was in Michigan and I figured out a way to make the timing work. So I know this was a conscious thing that I was going to do. Um, but I had all these doubts in my head about, is this terribly wrong? What am I going to be like if this happens? You know, how is it going to change my life? And it just became a horrible, horrible, horrible nightmare for me. Um, after I met this woman, and I, and I have to be clear that the encounter was what Bill Clinton would have called it. You know, he, you know, what does it mean? What is the definition of it? Um, so we didn't have intercourse. I actually would not allow it. Yeah, I was not, I was not going to let that happen, but somehow I thought that other things were okay. Um, well, it turned out I didn't really believe that. So I ended up thinking that after I crossed this line that I'd committed this horrible sin and violated every value that I had in my whole body. And I believed that God was actually going to punish me. I thought this was the biggest crime, the biggest sin I could, I could ever think of doing. I also got extremely paranoid and thought that somehow I was going to get AIDS from this encounter. And, and then I also thought I was going to get other diseases. So I got extremely paranoid about getting sick. And this all happened around the beginning of November. And somehow I made it through the end of the year trying to keep this whole thing a secret from my wife and my family. But I couldn't sleep at night. I was having panic attacks. I couldn't concentrate on anything. So it was kind of like I knew I was falling into an abyss, but there was nobody who could catch me because I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell anybody. So it was one of these things where I had to either figure out how to, how to deal with this myself or, or, or something. Uh, I did go see counseling from um, my rabbi, who some of you know. Um, his advice was something that I personally couldn't do. Um, you know, it wasn't the wrong advice. It just wasn't for me. I couldn't do what he wanted me to do. Uh, I ended up finally meeting with my wife and my therapist and having it, the whole conversation and shared everything with her, knowing I was taking a risk that she could like kick me out the door or worse. Um, but somehow I had the hope that she would understand that I was sick. And in fact, she did understand. And, and thank God, 2020, we're still, we're still together. But that's what started everything in terms of my real breakdown. So all of the depression and stuff was really just totally under, you know, not diagnosed, not recognized by anyone uh, other than myself. And I was afraid to talk about it. So early in 98, I started seeing a therapist uh, doing talk therapy, which did not absolutely nothing for me. Um, I decided I needed drugs. So I went to a psychiatrist who prescribed something. I don't even remember what it was. I think there were maybe two or three things. They didn't help at all either. And um, so it just became a, a downward spiral. Um, I finally stopped going to work. I would just stay in bed basically all day and not do anything except watch the X Games on on, U on ESPN. That's about all I could take was watching sport, sports on TV. So after several months of this, uh, by the time April came along, I became suicidal. Uh, I couldn't think of a way out of my condition other than just ending my life. And I didn't care what the ramifications were. I knew I would die, but I didn't care what happened to my family. I, I just knew I couldn't stand this anymore. So I was hospitalized once, and then I was released. And then by the time July came around, again, I got suicidal. And finally, my doctor said, there's only really one thing left that I think we can do, and that's electroconvulsive therapy. If any of you don't know what that is, it's also known as ECT. Uh, the slang term is shock treatments. When I was told that that was going to be my fate, I got extremely scared. Uh, all I could think of was one flew over the cuckoo's nest and lobotomies. And what if it doesn't work? I'm really going to be in, in, a, in a horrible position. But I reluctantly agreed to it. 
And I was extremely lucky because ECT actually brought me back. It was almost like one treatment. And when I woke up from that treatment, I felt like some, I'd been somewhere, but I didn't know exactly where, but I felt better. I felt good. And uh, interestingly enough, that afternoon of my first treatment, my wife, uh, I called my wife from the hospital and I said, would you bring my electric razor? And she asked me why I wanted it because I hadn't showered or shaved or anything in you know, a long time. I didn't care about my hygiene. I said, I need it because I look horrible. I need to shave. So something happened with, with ECT. I can't tell you why. I don't think the doctors can tell you why but it brought me back. And I've been so lucky that I haven't had to have any maintenance treatments, which is really unusual. Um, I don't know how many I had because I don't remember, um, but I, there are only a few things I don't remember uh, after the treatments. But um, by the time the end of 1998 came around, I was already you know, back to work in, well, in the fall. I was already back to work and starting on recovery. And to me, it seemed like everything was just back to normal. You know, I wasn't interested in the internet anymore. Uh, I, I wasn't interested in doing any of those things I had done. And I was just starting to live again. So I'm going to skip a lot of what happened since then because it's basically just life goes on. Um, but I do want to tell you that um, I got very much involved in learning about mental health and mental illness. And that, that really helped me with my recovery. Because one of the first things I learned is that I'm not any different than anybody else that has a mental illness. Uh, I used to think that mine was somehow not as good as other people's because I didn't, I wasn't strung out on drugs, I wasn't in jail, and I wasn't homeless. So my story is not that bad, you know. But I found out that that's not true. We all have so much in common between our anxieties and our our feelings of low self-esteem, and and you name it. That no matter what we've been through, we have a lot in common. So learning a lot about that helped me. Then, I, as uh, Paul said in my introduction, I've gotten into mental health counseling through NAMI, which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and doing a lot of group facilitating and education and speaking out about mental health. Um, my family stood by me for the whole time, which is something that's really unusual, and, and I credit them so much for, for helping me with my recovery. I also reached out to my synagogue and became much more involved taking classes with the rabbi and learning to lead services. Um, and several years ago, I started to write the book. And I'll tell you more about the book in a little bit, but uh, it took me many, 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 many years to get this book written. And I'd say probably 20% of all that time was actually writing and the other 80% was worrying about it. So, uh, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. So I want to talk about my childhood and kind of give you some thoughts about why I think this happened and where I, what I was like when I grew up. This is something I learned sort of putting the pieces together of writing the book. And I do want to use this analogy of the four children that are mentioned at the Passover Seder. And I'm actually just going to read you an excerpt of my book. I believe it's the introduction to my book that kind of, this is something that I based the book on. As a matter of fact, the title, the second title of the book originally was going to be the fifth child and uh, I decided to change it and I'll tell you more about that as well but at first the title was going to be the fifth child. So at the Passover Seder the answer to the four questions contains passages from the Torah about the four sons. The Torah describes four children who ask questions about the Exodus. Tradition teaches that these verses refer to four different types of children. The wise child asks a very detailed and lengthy question. What are the testimonies, the statutes, and the ordinances which the Lord our God has commanded you? The wicked child asks a question with some amount of sarcasm. What does the Passover service mean to you? The simple child asks a very uncomplicated question. What is this? And then the child who does not know how to ask, for this child, the parent must initiate the conversation and provide the answer to the unasked question. I believe that there is a fifth type of child. This child may be wise, wicked, or simple, and he knows how to ask a question. In fact, he has many questions about himself and his environment. He often wonders if other children ever feel the way he does, but he doubts that they do. He assumes that other children think poorly of him and wouldn't want to be his friend. 
This child thinks that other children are happier, more popular, more confident, and less afraid. This child thinks that he is just different. He's painfully shy. He wants to fit in, but he's afraid to make mistakes. He's afraid to admit that he did something wrong. He's terrified to admit that he doesn't know something or can't do something. Anything he does is just never good enough. He feels alone because no one else could be like this. No one else could understand. He can't talk about his feelings with other children because they would tease him or make fun of him. He can't talk about his feelings to teachers or other adults because he can't let anyone know that he's different. He can't ask for help. He must suffer in silence and conceal his feelings of inadequacy. He hides behind his mask, which is his sense of humor. He jokes, he laughs, he appears to be happy, but he can't let anyone get under the mask. He can't let them see his feelings of pain. He feels so alone, he can't cry out for help. He can't let them see he is flawed. He is not one of the four children. He is the fifth child, the child who is afraid or ashamed to ask. I am the fifth child. I lived in a nice neighborhood and was educated in one of the best school systems in the area. I was a talented musician and earned the opportunity to play in one of the best university marching bands in the country. I was always one of the smartest kids in class and I succeeded in earning an undergraduate degree and two graduate degrees. But all of my fears and insecurities stayed behind my mask, hidden as deep, dark secrets. I kept my fears to myself. I suffered in silence. I gutted it out. Since I never asked for help, I'm quite certain that I was living with clinical depression for many years. I wonder how life would have turned out if the fifth child could have spoken up years ago. So that's kind of the connection that I've come up with when I wrote the book as to my memories of childhood, my memories of growing up. There's a lot I haven't told you because of the interest of, in the interest of time about the impact of growing up in a house filled with Holocaust memories, uh, the impact of not going to Disneyland and instead going to visit other relatives who survived the Holocaust. Um, there were many things that contributed in my environment to how I viewed life. And the fact that I had an older brother who I thought was perfect and the apple of my father's eye certainly didn't help matters much either. So there's a lot about me that you don't know, but as I said, in the interest of time, I can't tell you what's in 230 pages of the book. But I do want to talk about why I wrote the book. What was the reasoning behind me putting out this particular book? First of all, I understand that stories are important. In the work that I've done with mental health organizations, I've learned a lot that people's stories are so important to help educate the public and to reduce the stigma of mental health, mental illness and addiction. Stories just help people understand that we have so much in common and that we're not alone. So we gain strength from each other's stories. Another reason is to provide hope and inspiration. Sometimes we lose all hope and wanna give up like I did when I was suicidal. I hope that my story will demonstrate that recovery is possible as long as we don't give up hope. One of the main reasons I wrote the book is because of other people like me who might be out there struggling. And my, my, uh, the onset of cyber sex addiction for me was in 1997, well, 95, 96, 97, before things like cell phones were really big, Zoom, video chat, all these other things. I was, I was still using cell phones that you had to pay for every call. I mean, it was, it was an expensive proposition. Um, just think if I were doing this nowadays, I could have a Zoom room full of people on my screen doing anything. Um, anybody can do it. And it's a bigger and bigger problem nowadays. And unfortunately, it's attacking even the young people in our society because they have access to all these tools. Um, so I really wanted to, to have it out there so people who need some sort of inspiration or hope for recovery would be able to get it. As I kind of said earlier, mental health and mental illness can happen to anybody. It doesn't discriminate, just like we've heard people talk about COVID-19. It's impacting more and more people every day. I've heard people used to talk about one in five, then it was one in four. I've heard people say one in three people are now in some way affected by mental health issues. And I also know that in the days of COVID-19 and isolation, that it's going to get worse. I've seen so much more attention 
paid to mental health and addiction issues now because of all the isolation and people who are having problems, their problems are just attenuated because of the fact that they're by themselves. Uh, I also heard recently that the sales of things like alcohol and tobacco are, are rising. Uh, so people are turning to their substance or drug of choice to basically numb themselves and, and alleviate their pain. For my own personal reasons, this helped to continue my recovery and my healing. As I've told you, I've been in recovery for about 22 years, but I'm constantly learning and growing. And in many ways, having depression was really a gift for me because it's taken me places I never thought I would go. It's actually created a person who's very full of empathy now and very caring. I used to be pretty much isolated and didn't really care much about other people, but I'm learning a lot now that uh, because I have the capability to share and the capability to, to be vulnerable, that I can actually communicate and help other people. And lastly, as the title of my book talks about releasing the shame, one of my biggest issues throughout this whole thing has been shame. Um, as I told you, my interaction with the woman, my interaction with all those other women in, in Cyberland, all of the thoughts I've had about women that I didn't tell you about that are in the book have led me to have a great deal of shame. And I spoke to a friend of mine who's addicted or was addicted to a substance. And I asked her, do you deal with shame because you were, you were addicted to some sort of a substance? She goes, absolutely. I said, well, I think I deal with shame because this is sexual and sexual is shameful. She said, no, every, any addiction, any of that act is gonna deal with shame because it's a, something that they, it's a behavior that you think you can change, but you, you can't necessarily do it. So a lot of the reason for me writing the book was to help me get rid of my own shame and the, the pain that I caused my family. Um, it's interesting because as I told you, the title of my book was, my original title was gonna be something called um, A Darkness That Can Be Touched, which is what depression is called in, in the Torah when they talk about the ninth plague. It was catchy, but it didn't really mean anything. Then the fifth child was the next title and that again was sort of clever, but again, didn't really mean anything. I made the choice to call this releasing the bounds of shame and to put the word cyber sex addiction right on the cover because I want this to scream to people. I want people to look at this and go, holy crap, somebody wrote a book about cyber sex addiction? I mean, th this is like really releasing my vulnerability. I am putting myself out there and I'm not, I'm not pulling punches because that's the only way that I know of to really get rid of my shame and, and to show that I'm vulnerable and it's okay to be vulnerable. And the interesting thing about the title from a Jewish perspective is there's a prayer that we say in the morning service, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Matir Asurim. Blessed are you, our God, King of the universe, who releases the bounds. When I read that in English, when we had a scholar in residence at our shul, I just jumped out of my seat and went, oh my God, that's the title of my book because releasing the bounds of shame is what I need to do. I, that, this, is, this is something, oh, we have an Amber Alert, sorry. Our curfew is starting in Atlanta. Um, so releasing the bounds of shame is all about my, my attempt, or what I hope to be successful, to be brave and to show that it's okay to be open, honest, and vulnerable. It's okay to let people in to see who I really am. And that's how I'm overcoming the shame. And frankly, if I get people who tell me, my God, Robert, you, that's weird, or what kind, of, what kind of a person are you? I'm, I'm just gonna answer them and say, you just don't understand. It's not my problem, it's your problem. Um, so that's why the book is the way it is. I wanted to, like I said, scream to people that if you know anything about this, you need to read this book. If you wanna learn about it, you need to read this book. And I, I really wish I could tell you more than I am telling you, but as I said, we're up against time and I can't obviously tell you everything. Um, but I do wanna share this quick two, two and a half minute video with you called Let Us Lift the Mask. So give me a second so I can get to this other, this other thing. Hopefully I won't screw this up. Uh, hold on just one second. I'm working on it, bear with me. Oh, it, it went away. 
Okay, I can I can get it back. Well, you're trying to get that back. I just want to respond. We had a question in the chat box that I want to respond to. Which okay. said, if oh, do you have it, Robert? Yeah, I do have it. All right, I'll get back to it later. Then we'll go to you. Thank you. Okay. Hold on one second. I forgot to click a certain box. Maybe you should get to that question, make sure I do this right. <laughs> okay. So the question was, if people get depressed at times, does that mean they have depression? Also, many people that get periodically depressed can work these issues out themselves. How frequently does this occur and should we define the most common causes of depression? So I, I you know, the first part of the question is, if people get depressed at times, does that mean they have depression? No, it does not mean they have clinical depression. It is very common for people to get down, get depressed from time to time. There may, we'll get into the reasons in just a moment, but in order to have clinical depression, to define it, we really have to take a look at somebody who is having issues, you know, most every single day for a period of at least two weeks. And those symptoms have to include a sense of, of distress and impairment and their ability to get things done. Uh, decreased mood, decreased interest in things, uh, either weight loss or weight gain, slowing down of thoughts or movement, decreased energy, feelings of worthlessness, inability to concentrate, or thoughts of death and wanting to die. Um, those are the classic symptoms that we're going to see with a major depressive episode. The kind of things that are most likely to bring them, and again, people can have elements of that, fewer elements of that, uh, over a very short period of time in reaction to something. The kind of things that are most likely to cause depression usually center around issues of loss. And by loss, it's kind of broadly defined as I see it. You know, It can be loss of a job. It can be loss of relationship. It can be a death of somebody who is close to you. It can be some mistreatment, so loss of safety. It can be a sense of loss of esteem because somebody feels like a failure, whether it's real or imagined, a loss of community, loss of health, you know, illness. And in some cases, I think this is part of what Robert was talking about, a loss of a sense of self and values and beliefs. And, you know, this crisis of uh, identity that somebody goes through when they feel like they're doing something that does not jive with the value system they have. Uh, it's, for most of the kind of times people feel down, have the blues, a brief depression, it's most common. You know, the vast majority of people get over that pretty quickly by themselves. In the cases of more significant depression, I think what Robert told us already was that it can be valuable. If you see this going on for weeks at a time, it doesn't seem to be improving. It's a great idea to speak to somebody. Speaking to somebody isn't always going to do the trick. And, you know, in Robert's case, he said the addition of psychopharmacology really did make a difference. And, you know, when we get into clinical depression, we're really talking about a biological condition. And so it may be that you need the medication to uh, help you deal with that. So um, hopefully that gives you some of an answer. And hopefully, Robert, you have your movie. I believe I do. It began with having much more paranoia than any child should have. It's like you can't come up for air. It's almost as if all your hopes and dreams just disappear. He would say, Dad, I'm going to tell you. It's like I'm sitting on the steps watching myself do something that I wish I wouldn't do, but I can't stop myself. What many people think is that this is a moral issue, um, not a medical one. So whenever you go to a psychologist, you are crazy. Because of that pressure, I felt kind of like, I shouldn't do that because I don't have a problem. Is this gonna be the new Michaela? Is that old Michaela gone? Are we ever gonna see her happy again? Is she ever gonna smile again? He had started to feel really badly. He called a psychiatrist, I'm like, we can see you in January. Like, we can't wait until January. So literally, he was like white knuckling it. I was right here looking at that house and realizing that um, he would never be back here again. I would tell people that she died of cancer.
because that was respectable. If you had a friend or a loved one that could not see the light at the end of the tunnel, would you go sit with them in the dark? There's always a piece of me that's hopeful, always. She said, Mom, I feel better. What reaches people the most is when they find out that someone in their daily life has gone through something terrible and they're still the same person that they had grown to love. That's how the fear stops. Are we back? Can you guys hear me again? Yes, we can. Okay, I just, I'm almost finished. I just need to put one thing back up. Okay, so just wanted to give, give the book a plug again. Uh, the amazon.com link is there. Um, I did want to share just a couple of other things about writing the book that I mentioned I was going to. Um, as I said, the book went through years and years and years of thought before I actually put uh, my fingers on the keyboard. Uh, and it went through a lot of iterations as to how I wanted to portray the story. Um, the book is actually written in, from childhood forward. That's not the way I did it tonight, but it, it starts with my birth. <laughs> and uh, the first thing my mother supposedly said when I was born was take him away because I was the wrong gender. Um, so, and it starts from there. <laughs> so uh, it, it really goes through a lot of detail about growing up in the school systems, uh, the thoughts I had about what it was like to be a, a nice Jewish boy in a nice Jewish suburb, um, and then kind of continuing on through the rest of my life. But as you heard me talk about in my story, I was, I was deathly afraid of many things. Uh, my self-esteem was horrible. Um, when I got caught cheating on a chemistry quiz and was given a zero, I thought the entire school would be talking about it and it would be written it up in the school paper, like anybody really cared. Um, I, I just couldn't take that kind of embarrassment, you know. So I lived a life very much behind the mask, as I talked about. I have, I depended on my sense of humor to try to get people to like me. And uh, it's interesting because some people have connected with me on Facebook who have bought my book and didn't know anything about me since high school. And they all, you know, th these people say things like, but you were so talented, you were so smart, you were so funny, you were so musical. I said, yeah, that's the point. Uh, that's what you saw. Um, the pain that I went through behind the mask is something that nobody saw. My parents didn't know it. My, uh, my wife and kids didn't know it. And everything was just left inside me because I was afraid to come out and talk about it. And there's that stigma acting again that I was afraid to let anybody know that anything was going on with me. So that's my story. And I thank all of you for joining and listening and let's see if we have any any questions or if there's any discussion you want to have i'm here to answer questions and i said that would take less than 20 minutes and i lied <laughs> i was just gonna say thank you so much robert that was an incredible story uh very very powerful uh, thank you really you know brings out the importance of the fact that you know, oftentimes there are early strains of things that uh, are going to set this in motion that we see it in childhood oftentimes, that it is usually covered up, that it, you know, most people try to hide, as you say, you know, stay behind the mask, but eventually it takes somebody of great coverage to kind of step out from that and to be very public. So we thank you. And on behalf of Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs, this is a huge service that you're doing. Uh, we do want to open this up to any questions. You have the ability to unmute yourself. Feel free to ask anything. So uh, Bernice, glad you liked it. Glad it was, yeah, we thought it was a good presentation as well. And, and Paul, all those things, Paul, all those things you said about clinical depression, I probably had all of those. <laughs> Demon, Dix. Yeah, so um, 
there's just so much here that those of us who want to learn how to be listeners to 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 make it so that people like Robert can know that they can be heard. I've learned so much tonight and this this has been so valuable and this recording if Robert if you're okay with it I think this recording is going to be around for a while. Um, it, it, you've just sort of laid it all out and this is thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, well thank you for thinking of me Steve and, and your comment makes me think about um, the ability for people to become good listeners. Um, a lot of that depends on education. Um, you know, like part, of, part of my issue uh, of coming out and talking about these things is what reaction will I get from people who are unaware? You know, will I get this negative reaction? Um, but I found in talking to so many people who have mental illness diagnoses, even if they're different than mine, you know, I've talked to people who have schizophrenic problems. I've talked to people who have bipolar issues. And although our labels are different, our feelings are very much the same. You know, so, so if we can normalize things to a point where I understand what anxiety feels like, I understand what fear feels like, I understand what self-esteem issues feel like, then we have a, a commonality. We have something that we can reach out and talk to each other about. And so I think it's important for that especially with, with I, I always pick on the, the, on the diagnosis of schizophrenia because it sounds so horrible. You know, the word itself, like what, what is that? And now we have schizoaffective disorder and we have all these other names. Depression just sounds like oh, I was sad, so that's not so bad. But we have to come up with ways to use our language better. And I think those of us who are speaking, you know, we, we tend not to use words like crazy anymore. You know, those words just don't, they're not part of our vocabulary, but it's the, the rest of the world, if they can learn that, that language to how to listen to us and, and speak back to us in our language, that would go a long way to, to make communication better, I think. And I always, you know, there but for the grace of God go I. Lifetime prevalence of mental illness is somewhere upwards of 40 to 50 and in some reports, it could be up to 70% over the lifespan. So, you know, the chance of any of us going through this at some point is very, very high. Looks like we might have a hand from the Bernstein household. Is that true? And then Steve Mandel. Yeah, this is Marcia Bernstein. I'm Chuck Bernstein's wife. And first of all, Robert, I want to thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What you just did was not easy. I can just imagine. My older son, who is 41 years old, is bipolar. And this summer, this past, this past last summer, he had a bout with his um, bipolar and his depression. And he's been in the hospital where he was gonna commit suicide. And he said to me, mama, the only thing that stopped me were my three children. And he'd already gone through the divorce that he went through. But I wanna thank you, Robert, for doing this. Cause I think it was a, I think it was a fantastic program and I just want to thank you. Well, thank you so much, Marsha. I, I have to admit that um, I couldn't have done this a few years ago. I wasn't, wouldn't have been ready. Um, I've done a lot of growing and, it, it, and it's helped me a lot to be able to communicate about these things. I'm still working on the shame part. It's not all gone, but it's getting there. Thanks, Steve Mandel. Yeah, so I admire your courage and honesty to tell your story, but my question is, could you describe what you see as the value of peer support groups and support groups for families as you go through this process for both yourself and what you tell others? Well, I've spent a couple of years as a peer specialist, and I, I can honestly say that, in my opinion, the, the biggest benefit of peer specialists is that we have lived it. And I'm not, I don't want to say anything negative about the medical profession because I know Paul is in that profession and he's certainly well learned, you know, a learned man and has a great deal of experience. Um, but I have to tell you, when you get one on one with somebody who's, you know, almost in a crisis state and you can empathize with them and not talk about a medical solution or a pharma, pharmacy solution, you can just sit there and say, 
you are expressing a great deal of anxiety and I know exactly how that feels because I've been there. Let me tell you what, what I've been through. And then you start sharing with each other and then you start sharing what, what works for you, what kind of coping skills work for you or what's, what's something that you can do to get yourself to a, a, the next level of improvement. Um, so it's really, it, it's really so much of, a, of what I guess I would say the commonality. The, as I said before, it doesn't matter what the diagnosis is, what the label is. It's the emotion and it's the feeling. And I, I'll, I'll give you an example of one that I'll never forget. I was working as a peer specialist and we had a, a warm line. It wasn't a crisis line, but people could call us if they were in, having issues. And I got a call in the middle of the night, a gentleman on the phone telling me that his wife couldn't sleep and, and she was talking like, you know, she was suicidal and he didn't know what to do. And he didn't know if she would come on the phone. So I, I, I said to him, please try to get her on the phone. And so she did, and we started having a conversation. And at the end of 20 minutes, she thanked me and told me she was ready to go to sleep. And then the woman, I'm, I'm sorry, the man came on the phone and said, I don't know what you did or what you said, but you are an angel. And so all it, it's just, it's just a way of the peers understand, the peers have empathy. The, the, the peers don't know clinical stuff. You know, I don't know the difference between this drug and that drug. I don't know the difference between one illness and another. But because I have lived experience, it just makes it easy for me to communicate with those people. And I think the same holds true with families. We have, a, in, in NAMI, we have a family support group that is led by facilitators who are caregivers. And it's, it's a very, very popular and well-attended, you know, group because everyone's trying to figure out what do I do with my son? What do I do with my husband? What do I, what do I do? What do I do? And the mental health arena or system is difficult to, to work your way through. And so, you know, it, it takes a lot of work. So people have already done it. I think there's a lot of, a, a lot of good things that come from that kind of discussion. Now, you guys are making me feel self-conscious. Some of you are smiling, which means I think you're secretly chatting between each other. And because I'm who I am, that makes me feel self-conscious. <laughs> I think you can relax. The only comments I've seen are what a great job you've done, which we really appreciate. And I do want to mention, you know, coming from as a clinical psychologist uh, and spending my life in working in mental health, it is incredibly powerful to have peer mentors, peer leaders, you know, uh, to help you sit by, side by side. When I was running a, a community mental health center, uh, we engaged peer leaders uh, very early on, and it was a huge boost to, to you know, kind of balance what we were saying. It's one thing to be able to talk the talk. It's another to have walked the walk, and uh, there's a special bond that we see, so I salute you for what you did in that area, Robert. Uh, Neil Golden had something. He had his hand up. Hello, Neil. Hello, Robert. Um... Uh, forgive me, but I'm going to have to go in a second, but I want to just tell you a couple of things. First of all, I'm proud to have known you for as long as I have and in a long time. And I'm proud to call you friend and really proud of, of what you've done with this. It's just, just, it's fantastic. Thank you, Neil. Neil and I were like best friends growing up. We learned how to dive in as fast as we could in Hebrew school. And then somehow that, that friendship has uh, maintained itself. Pretty amazing, 60, 60 years maybe. Pretty much, pretty dang close. And anyway, I wish everyone a safe uh, and a healthy evening. Robert, I'll talk to you soon and thank you for the invite. I really appreciate it. Sure, say hi to Carolyn. And I will say hi to family. We'll talk to you soon. Take Bye -bye. care. Okay, we got a question for Bernice's iPad. And Bernice, I don't know if you can um, unmute, but you were asking about at what point do you get the person to acknowledge that they have a problem? Can you say just a little bit more about that, if you're able to? I know, Bernice, you are muted. It's rare for her to be muted. Hi, Bernice. <laughs> I'm asking to unmute. Okay, she's unmuted. Um, let's see here. Yeah. My husband just unmuted. He's going to ask the question. Hi, Bye. Bruce. Hey. He's on one iPad and I'm on one iPad. I see that. 
How are you doing, Robert? It was a great uh, that all all that you shared. Um, if 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 you see somebody who seems really angry and hard to, you know, and, and you know they're going through issues, but but they don't really want to, address, you know, to address them or 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 to let let their guard down. What what do you what do you recommend? I think I want to defer that one to Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just waiting to see what the heck you were going to say. <laughs> <laughs> this is where I go. I'm not a professional. <laughs> it's a hard. It's a hard one. You know. Yeah. Um, I think what we try to do, if you, the best thing we can usually do is try to be an active listener, and if you see somebody who seems to be struggling. You know, it is perfectly fine to say, gee, you know, I, I've noticed, you know, you seem a little bit off. Is there anything on your mind you want to talk about? Or, you know, boy, that really seemed to bother you. Um, is there something you want to talk about? Or, you know, is everything okay? I, I noticed that, you know, you're not acting like the way you usually do. And just leave it at that. And they may say, no, I'm fine. Everything's okay, whatever. You know, if you can in, just leave it, you know, let them take the lead. It's very important to not push people into uh, forcing them to feel like they have to say anything. But, you know, what I always try to say is, look, if you ever want to talk, I'm available. You know, my number, here it is. Get reach out by all means. Um, sometimes if somebody, you know, they need a little time to think about it. Um, and then they come back to you and say, yeah, I really do need to talk to somebody either. Can we talk or do you have somebody in mind? But more than anything, it's just be there to listen and be a sounding board for what's going on. And if you notice behavior changes, there's nothing wrong with pointing that out, but not being accusatory. You just want to use it as an opening to hopefully have discussion. If they're not ready for it, you don't push it. That's what I say. Anything you want to add to that, Robert? Well, yeah, I guess one of the main things is approach it as positively and, and constructively as you can. You know, don't say something like, is there something wrong? What's wrong with you? Um, because that will put people on the defensive very easily. Um, in in peer specialist class, I know some people used a technique that I personally did not like. It, I felt like it was putting people on the spot, but sometimes you'd be in a conversation with somebody and they tell you how, what they're doing or how they're doing, and they might say said something like, so how's that working for you? <laughs> I never liked that approach, but it made people think. It's like, well, I'm not really satisfied with what's going on. And then then you can maybe start a conversation with, so what would be better, you know, like, tell me something that you would like to be able to do that you're not doing now, or how can we work on establishing a, a goal or something like that? You know, but the, as, as Paul said, listening is very important and, and, you know, trying to keep it as positive and, and constructive as you can. Great. Thanks to both of you. We have a question from, let's see, Sharon Lightstone. Robert, what do you suggest for teens in terms of helping peers deal with mental health issues? What is being done or is in the works for training with USY in being uh, and more aware of this? Is that something that your initiative is thinking about addressing, Paul? It is, but maybe you could comment from NAMI or from other perspectives. Yeah, um, NAMI itself has a couple of programs that are geared towards school age um, I'm trying to remember which one is which. Uh, there's one program called Ending the Silence, and I think that's the one that's geared towards parents and teachers. Uh, what we're trying to do at NAMI is establish a partnership between the parents and the teachers uh, so that both parties are more aware of the things that they should be looking for if they see interesting, not interesting, if they see behaviors that are different uh, sudden changes in, in mood, things of that sort. Um, and the program that they're trying to teach them has to do with, again, ways of communicating, ways of asking, ways of, of not confronting, if you will. Uh, so I know that there are a couple of those things in, 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 that are in place now. Not, I'm pretty sure ending the silence is the one I'm thinking of. Um, the problem that I see right now, at least in terms of what I know from NAMI, is that we don't have enough when it comes to things like support groups for young people. Um, most of the people that come to my support groups are well into their adult years. Uh, and some people will say, do you have support groups for, our, for teens, for 18 year olds, et cetera? 
And I don't think that we have anything like that yet. So I, I guess I don't know enough about what other things are available outside of NAMI, but uh, I, I do have to say that there's a growing need for it. I wish I had a better answer though. I'll just pick on that really quickly. Sharon, thank you so much for asking the question. Uh, this Imagine Life initiative, this mental wellness initiative that we're trying to begin with FGMC, and again, we thank every one of you for being here. We're going we're to go on for a few more minutes and then we're going to call it a night, um, is an attempt to help deal with stigma, with bias, open up the discussion, make the Jewish home a safe place to talk about this. You know, it's interesting, one of the areas that we focused on uh, early in our discussions was substance abuse as well, as I spoke to many individuals who had issues with alcohol or drug abuse, and they were going to 12-step programs. And one of the problems they had was that they said, I always go to one of those programs and there's a cross on the wall, because it's churches that host these. It's not synagogues for the most part. We have not done a great job of following up with inviting those folks into our Jewish homes. So part of our initiative is going to engage students and we what we would like to do is help have some trainings for probably usy age kids to help engage discussion with hebrew school age kids and so on and their peers uh, we're looking at doing trainings on both the adult level as well as the teen level so that we can address it in both spaces we also have a number of movies that we've already started to think about that we would like to show for families which would uh, begin the discussion about a lot of these issues. So these are all thoughts, you know, potentially in the work works. If anybody has suggestions, we are only too happy to hear about them. Okay, why don't we take uh, one more question if somebody has one. Anybody out there a question? Let me do a quick follow up to that, to the question about the, the, the youth. Um, Sharon, I don't, there's, I wish I could remember the name. If I find it, I'll let you know. But I know that in California, there's a lot of things going on where kids in middle schools and high schools start like mental health clubs. There's a specific program whose name escapes me. Uh, if I can find it, I will let you know. Um, but that's another way that some of the schools are starting to deal with things like that by starting basically clubs where people, you know, the kids can learn about things, can learn how to talk to each other about things. Um, you know, it, it's more than like anti-bullying. It's, it's like, you know, we're, they're really talking about issues that kids get into. If I can find it, I will certainly send you that information. Yeah. Um, Robert, I think it's sources of strength that you're thinking of, is it not? It doesn't sound familiar. It doesn't but, sound like it. Okay. Sources of strength is about that in the school. But okay. thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay. I think that's it for the night. Um, again, Robert, thank you so very, mm -hmm. very much for you are so welcome. your story, uh, your honesty. It, it makes such a difference to get the ball rolling. We hope that we can count on you maybe in the future to continue to be involved with this. I know we're engaging a group uh, out of Atlanta, Blue Dove. Uh, who has been very actively involved, which we are thrilled about as well. Yeah, they, think, they're, friend, they're friends of mine too. <laughs> and I want to thank each and every one of you for being here because this is an important initiative. And one of the things that FJMC took on that nobody was touching a number of years ago was KRU. How do we integrate intermarried couples, you know, within the conservative movement? Nothing was happening until the Federation started to do it. And I can tell you when it comes to mental health and substance abuse, nobody has really been doing this until we're starting this initiative as well. The fact that every one of you are here, we hope that we can count on you over time to help move this forward, spread the word and do any, you know, again, we are open to any suggestions whatsoever people may have. I wanna thank FJMC, Alan Budman, Stephen Dix, Gary Smith, some of the members of the committee and again, uh, most sincere thanks to Robert, and he has posted his uh, book. So please take a look at that on Amazon. We hope you have a wonderful night. We hope you all stay safe. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. I appreciate you being here. Bye-bye.